I'm a lifelong musician in the San Francisco Bay Area, singer, songwriter, perform with lots of different bands. And all that music comes from seeing the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. So I fell in love with music and the Beatles the same day. In late 1980, early 1981, um, I got a call from an old bandmate of mine who had uh, gone from playing guitar to buying and selling vintage gear. As Dan was having breakfast in Soest, West Germany, he's reading a newspaper and scanning one ad, and in it was an ad for a four tracken recording console. The phone rang uh, in my house in Oakland, California. I picked it up and he said, Hey, Chris, it's Dan. And he said, uh, Do you want to buy the Beetleboard? And I said, Say that again. And he said, You want to buy the Beetleboard? Pretty much without hesitation, I said, yeah. This console arrived in San Francisco in 81 uh, on five pallets. It, it splits into five modules. There's the two lower, two upper, and this middle module, and installed it in a bedroom. Um, it, it lived there for roughly 10, 12 years. One of the qualifications for the deal was that um, my friend Dan knew that I loved the Beatles and he said, at some point you're going to have to sell it. The keepers of the console moved my, from my hands to, to Lenny Kravitz and has been in his hands ever since. I remember walking into the control room, this was sitting uh, just in the corner and uh, Henry, first thing he said out of his mouth is, welcome to 1960. <laughs> um, and I do remember that first walking in, how hot the room was just because there was so much tube gear. It is sort of the last iteration of, of tube or valve consoles. It's the highest form of it. And it was not made to be mass produced, so it was made with the highest quality um, in mind at every step of the way. It's like a precision machine, and it's, it's, it's uh, like an old piece of military gear. It's really sturdy. REDD, Recording Engineering Development Division, um, made the RED 37. It was uh, it turns out it was an offshoot of the Red 17. It was the next generation. The Red 17 was the first console uh, that EMI made in roughly 1955. And the evolution came to this Red 37. There was a prototype, and then there were two of these Red 37s made. This one, um, it was used to record the Beatles right up to about 64, the first record and a few things. Um, and also, let it be. Four track recording was just becoming the name of the game. So it has eight inputs and four outputs. It's an eight in, four out console. It's very simple and it's very the point. There's a, a treble control and a bass control and it has a plus and minus configuration. Um, each pair of channels shares a module that dictates the frequency responses that are the, where the treble cuts and, and subtracts and where the bass boosts and subtracts. Um, they're exchangeable. When you see the, see the top of this, you'll see that there's these little protrusions. It says pop on all these particular modules. That's two specific EQ points. Um, there are also classic modules. When you lift this battleship of a frame up, a wing nut pulls out a box that is contains that which dictates the, the frequency response. You can pop in the classic module, turn the wing nut, and there you go. This thing is uh, avoided catastrophe, I guess, twice because we had it um, fly from Paris and it was going to the Bahamas um, to a studio there. And it came in two days before the Sandy flood came in Hoboken where all our gear was stored. And it left two days just before that storm hit. And that storm hit and took out our whole building. Um, we lost um, so many guitars, so many amplifiers, so many keyboards. Um, it was a warehouse for all our gear and, um, and all our touring gear. Um, so everything came back from tour, went into that building, and the flood took it out, you know, eight feet of water all across. So luckily this thing left two days before and didn't end up the fate as everything else did. The console was moved from my bedroom down to a workshop because one of the parts of the deal was we wanted to make sure the whole thing is functioning properly. So we moved it. Um, and got it down there and two weeks later uh, there was a huge uh, kind of a cataclysm in the Oakland Hills It was called the Oakland Firestorm on October 20th 1991 and it flattened everything including my house so had the console been left there 
it would be gone. So for that reason, it's, a, it's really great that it's still alive and well and continue its, its legacy. Everybody asks me what it sounds like, and the best way I could describe it is kind of like a Cadillac. It's just very smooth sounding. The Beatles were really extremely good at, just as a, as a songwriting team and as performers, um, of generating this massive amount of creative energy. Um, and especially the first record, this recorded the entire first record, that they could walk in a room and play that stuff and sing that stuff on the spot. And it wasn't about, it wasn't about cutting and pasting and let's move that over there and we, ah, you did a good chorus, let's like, copy and paste it across. It wasn't about working in the box, it was about they had to actually play and sing and do what they do and have the chemistry of human beings that made it so. And this facilitated capturing that. And it always stands out to me that, that we could do better to have, there's gotta be some law that you can only have eight by four and see how good you actually are. This console is a part of me that will go on to whoever you know, takes over it. So it's, you know, it, it just has that essence. I, if, if your souls can bleed out a little bit on each, uh, each instrument or each thing that you touch, um, yeah, there's always going to be a little bit of you that goes with it.